Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. All right. We're uh, talking about termination. Yes. Kill or, or Team tarnation. Termination. What in tarnation is Kill Team Termination? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite out of the pair out of the pair of teams? You know, last time you were on here, we talked about Felgor. Before that, we were talking about Hearthkin. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite pair in the box, Ace? Uh, I think I prefer Hearthkin. Uh, no, Jagir, sorry. But only because the aesthetic. I think the the powerhouse is the 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 blue, blue, blue brothers. Yeah, I think I'm kind of that's kind of my current opinion as well. Like brood brothers, you read the rules and they, I think on a competitive level they feel obviously powerful because they've got mm-hmm. a combination of like lots of tricks and lots of activations and good enough re rolls and all the options. <laughs> but Hernkin seem. I think I was writing the review for Goonhammer and I think they have. A really flavorful rule set like they feel very cool like their ploys are super cool too mm-hmm. i agree I, and i think they are good i think they are lacking one one inch of movement to be honest mm. uh, i yeah. think they're missing a medic that too yeah <laughs> yeah they're like they're like a shooting team that just like has to take it on the chin which i think seems mm-hmm. a little weird although i uh, have been played a lot uh, with elucidian uh, the ploy of uh, reducing the damage to the to the half is so powerful. Yes, and then with with eight goons, really good. Yeah, we de- I definitely call that out in my review on Greenhammer. I think mm-hmm. when Jason and me were talking about it last night, just kind of as like a little intro prep for this podcast episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that team wide reduced damage is really gross. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Nothing can kill you actually, so that's really good. Yeah, they're gonna be like surprisingly tanky. I like. Yes. I think they're significant. Like my opinion, I think they're significantly tankier than the Space Marine Scouts. Hmm. hmm. Could be. I think they they are t- tankier on on melee than his brothers, but they are way worse on on shooting against shooting. Yeah. the The pair of teams is definitely pretty cool. I think let's just dive into the the Hurricane a little bit because this will be for some of our listeners maybe the first time that they're hearing anything about termination. So mm-hmm. we've got a team similar to the Mandrakes where we only have seven operatives that are cool and then three guys are just dorks. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? Well, the good thing, uh, to be honest, is that you can build all your kill team with one box. And I think that's that's really cool. But yeah, I would, I would prefer to have a team, 10 different operatives. But, you know, it is what it is. And on this, on this season, it is what it is, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're getting a couple more teams that have a couple more basic operatives floating around, mm. which on some level can be good, at least for learning a team. I think of the two teams, mm. the Jaeger are much easier to learn. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jason's got Jason between me and Jason. Jason picked up the, the Jaeger. He said he had how was the how was the building process for anyone looking to pick up the box and uh you know, build team. It, it's, it was like, it's pretty simple. Um, for whatever reason, I've really been taking my time with it. Uh, you know, I've <laughs> been spending like 45 minutes per model because I dry fit it, get distracted. My glue doesn't <laughs> stick. I like let something uh, put the glue on and then just wait for a long time. But Wandering yeah, I, like process. everything fit really well, really easy. Like the instructions were mm-hmm. really clear because there's we've had plenty of times where there were kill teams that were like, you have to like be like read through the instructions a couple times. This you can just like jump right in. Seems like it's really straightforward, really easy to build them. Is mm-hmm. there a lot of optionality on like the arms and legs, or is it similar to some other teams where you get exactly like one body for like one one pair of arms? Because I know veteran guard back in the day it was like you could do whatever arms and whatever model but I, I don't know how good i also haven't built any of the the dwarf team so i have no idea how how clean those lines are yeah i didn't try to stray from the instructions really at all um, i but it it looks like you probably could 
Nice. All right. Well, I mean, as far as the the cool stylish operatives, I think that I don't know if they've previewed the rules on Warham Warcom at this point, but we've got the <laughs> what's the coolest operative for both of you? Mm, for me, I think the coolest operative is the I don't know the name in English because I have the instructions on, on Spanish, but it's the guy with the two pistols. Yeah, the Jaeger Bombast. The Bombast. Who's, who's got the brand new range of range nine on a pistol, which we've <laughs> never seen, which is really good, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, four attacks on threes, three five, lethal five, balanced, which is pretty solid. It's going to kill most things that are on seven wounds or eight wounds, just because you're probably going to get a crit between five dice, right? Mm -hmm. And he can like shoot you at the beginning of the turn, mm -hmm. like out of yeah. activation, which is pretty gnarly. And then he can also shoot on his actual activation. So he's got the Rotlock Negotiation, which is a free shoot action at the beginning of a turn. And you can <laughs> flip from Conceal to Engage. So if you stage him properly and your opponent is not paying attention, suddenly a guy with two pistols pops over a vantage point, blows you up. Mm. And, and being with nine inches, they can shoot to pretty much anything on the, on the battlefield, especially yeah. on Into the Dark. He's going to be a, a really good piece on, on Into the Dark. And he has something like a, it's not a blast, but it's a, a stun, a stun rule, but with the two inches from the operative he kills. And I think that can be a game changer if you play it right. Yeah, against a horde team, if a veteran mm -hmm. guard player is staged around a door and you catch someone, you get the brazen killer, which is you roll a die for each operative within two inches of the original target. And if you get higher than their APL, then you mm -hmm. they get stunned, which... Seems really gross, especially if you can angle it. So he starts in a position. So at the beginning of turn two, he pops a shot off that your opponent is not expecting. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there's a little stun blast. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah, I think I'm going to say my favorite operative is the Thane. It's a pretty easy choice. He's just a <laughs> thick boy. He's just the thickest boy. Um, if when you kill him the first time, he survives and stays on one wound. Um, combined with his like half damage, he gives you extra points um, of the uh, the resourcefulness or whatever that stuff is called. Um, yeah, so for anyone that hasn't heard their whole shtick so far, um, the Jaegers get these uh, resourceful points that they can spend to either heal or gain an extra APL. So it's it's kind of like the caster can comes, but no one has to do an action to give you the APL. Um, and your, your leader simply being alive lets you do another one. So take that, Space Marine Scouts. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think the big thing is that you also cannot be in engagement range, and you can also use them to heal. So I think being able to do a little bit of both means that if you can keep your operatives alive with the tough survivalist ploy, which is the Star Strider's damage block, if you can keep yourself alive and you get to the next turn, you can also just heal back up to an appropriate level of usefulness and then start tapping people again, so... There's going to be some interesting baits. I think one of the cool things about the Thane, unlike a lot of leader operatives that we've been getting, is that he can just he just has everything. There's no build option for him. He just comes with both the shotgun and the pistol and a knife. <laughs> so gone gone is having to choose between your plasma gun and your and your like shitty pistol. But he doesn't have any AP profile, so I guess he follows a the long line of hearthkin thanes that don't have good range option <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the shotgun's pretty good shotgun's yeah. good yeah it's it's also got extra ammo which i don't know if it'll ever be used i don't know ace if uh, you think stabilized shells are ever going to be important <laughs> not me no group <laughs> not for me no no i don't think so yeah, four dice on threes or twos, four, four damage has been pretty good, I think, historically against the seven wound, eight wound teams, mm -hmm. just because you can reliably get enough pop shots in to end people. Yeah, the combination yeah. of short movement and short range shooting, I think, is going to be really tough to really make it shine. Four inch movement mm -hmm. and six inch guns. It's like, ooh, yikes. Mm -hmm. Have you, uh, has anyone here kind of thought of ways to start interacting with the lack of movement on this team. So unlike their Hearthkin Salvager brothers, you only get four inches of movement and you only get a four up save compared to the five inches of movement and the, and the three up save. But you get shotguns, which are a little bit more reliable than anything the Hearthkin have in close range. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, 
or Ace, when you were here talking about the Salvagers, you talked about using knives and ramping up your damage because people have grudge tokens, so you get a lot of mm -hmm. free crits or a lot of P1 from your guns. Have you thought about any ways where you can kind of get the Jaeger to do what you want, even though they only have four inches of movement? Or do you feel like that four inches of movement right now is going to be what gets them stuck? It's, it's going to be tough, that's for sure. But you have the um, your passive ability, so they can forward deploy. Three, mm -hmm. three of the three of the guys that should help on on the first turning point to to reach the objectives, because with the with his brothers it's difficult. You have the of, of course you have the 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 jump pack uh, or the lager that can reach to the objective markers, but other than that, it's, it's really difficult and it's really tough to 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 be somewhere or to score. Uh, I don't know, uh, recover item, for example. Mm -hmm. But with these guys, with three uh, guys on forward deploy, that should be a little bit easier. Other than that, the, the other passive um, allows you to make some beautiful, I think, plays with the with the with the thane. He can charge into someone, kill him, and then shoot with the shotgun, and then you have six, six inches move, which is not much, but it it might be enough. Yeah, I think right now it looks like on turn one because you get three four deployed models that cannot do aggressive actions. Mm -hmm. At least you cover the rough part that salvagers have where you can't get to the mid board objectives at all because mm -hmm. you can definitely get to the mid board if you have all of the extra movement tricks which is which is useful mm -hmm. and then after that if you can stage a safe turn you can set up for an aggressive turn too yeah the and yeah. like synergizing that you've got the four deploy and you can give them the extra apl so you can like jet those little dudes like 10 inches out on turn one and still do an action which uh, is... This is actually one of the big. This was one of the big things that got missed. I think in the Goonhammer initial review, you can actually use resourceful on turn one. It does yes. say at the end. It actually is after the first turn. So you are using the forward deploys to get you into position, and you're using the super conceal to make sure that anyone that's in a risky spot is not going to get shot at. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it looks like, anyways. Wait, so yes. you can or can't use resourceful on turn one? Cannot. You cannot. Yeah. No. Lame. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I would love that the because the Thane uh, have some resources points too, get you some some points. I would love that at least his point uh, can be used on turning point one. Mm -hmm. Only one that would be awesome. That's just the one. Yeah, just to make sure that you can get to. I think there definitely the maps on the diagonal where you have four mid board maps mm -hmm. like positions. This team still will have trouble getting over there. Yes. Yeah. But I think on most maps, I think the extra three inches means that you can at least reliably get all three, all three of your initial points to kind of like yeah. stage up. Yeah, not being able to use resourceful does make it incredibly tight and telegraphed. Whereas before, it was like I don't know when I when I thought they could use resourceful on turn one, I was like, oh yeah, they can totally hang, and that was a great solution. No, wow, 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 wow. Unfortunate. I do think it's cool that the, each of the, I was telling uh, Jason last night, each of the operatives on the Hernkin, you know, Jaeger team, they each kind of have their own little mini game going on. Yes. You know, obviously, Ironbreak, the guy who drops mines, seems really <laughs> annoying. And very important, actually, to kind of breaking that turn one symmetry, because you can set up mines to force your opponent to take longer positions around to their first couple points, because it can be anywhere on the map that's not in your opponent's deployment zone, more than six inches away from your other mines. And three yeah. of them will be real and two of them will be fake. And your opponent's got to got to respect that or take potentially a lot of wounds because <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. flat three plus potentially you know, D D something. It's like so, D six, depending on your D6. opponent's save. Yes, uh, depending on your opponent's save, so it's capped off by your opponent's save. So it it can be four into an or team, so you can destroy one or team if you are lucky, which is hilarious. Uh, for me, the thing about the, the Iron Breaker is that he can prevent you from being grenade, or at least your opponent, if he want to throw you a grenade on open, he if he eats the mine, uh, then he might be injured, and that could be enough. If yeah. you position well, I think. Yeah. Uh, the Iron Break's ability is basically you set up five mines, three of them are real, two of them are fake. They take three damage flat plus D6, and if you roll under your opponent's save, they take that many extra wounds. So it gets much better against low armored targets. Yes. Uh, they cannot be on objectives, which is really important. So all your opponent will absolutely always be able to move around them because you're never going to be able to put them in a do or die situation. If you touch this objective, you blow up. 
because they cannot be on objectives. So, mm -hmm. But the two inch bubble means that your opponent is taking much longer paths around to their objectives, which mm -hmm. can be also enough for you to break symmetry on turn one. I yeah, think. and like usually if your opponent does have a way to alpha strike you, you can see it and you could just put a mine there. And that's mm -hmm. that's like kind of what Ace was saying earlier. Um, but I think it applies to more than just the grenades, but to like any alpha strike. And I think that's a really good point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the big thing on that guy is that when he activates, he can reset a mine. <laughs> so there's like an entire activation minigame around when you can reset an iron break or if it's even worth it to bother activating him to reset the iron break. Because the iron breaks base stats and on his weapons are kind of poop. And the equipment will, will fix him, though. Um, yeah. But actually, before we get too far along on that, is 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 the Iron Break your favorite operative from the Jaegers, Travis? Or is it someone else? I think, honestly, it's probably the Jaeger tracker. Like, Sam Fisher's out here playing Splinter Cell, <laughs> the opponent's <laughs> midline. Like, when I read all the all the operatives, everyone's, like, pretty neat. But then the tracker stands alone as, like, he has a whole separate game that you get to play that mm -hmm. I think Corsair Voids card talked about in their rules but it was never worth doing where if you hit and ready to operative you get an extra bonus because this operative this team is 10 operatives you actually have a few more situations where you will run into that versus corsair void scars nine maybe eight activations where you really weren't getting to ready to operatives asymmetrically especially in melee like your opponent is not like you're charging people who are ready if you can you're not charging people who are already activated so the Jaeger tracker has bonuses specifically around hitting people who have already activated. And if he's within six inches of them, he ignores obscurity and he treats you as ready. So he has a free free order flip, which seems yes. really good. And he also gets the cult reroll, basically reroll any one type that shows up kind of all over the place nowadays. Mm -hmm. And he's got a pair of silent weapons, which are both pretty good. And me and Jason were talking about how the equipment can, uh, you can put a shotgun on him and he can do your best uh, imitation of playing a video game from uh, 2008. <laughs> <laughs> a really good video game, though. <laughs> yeah. I like him. It was for me, um, if you can use the resource, resourceful uh, on turning point one, it will be awesome because then he will become your grenadier or some kind of mm -hmm. grenadier because then you can move that and use your your hatchet uh that would be awesome because he's he's the the the, the little the the axe is super good like the yeah. profile is amazing it's a uh, four four attacks on threes three five silent rending and because if you're hitting ideally you're only ever going to attack some people who are not readied with this guy yes. just because mm -hmm. he gets base rerolls then you can reroll any one type and then the four type four dice on threes is probably pretty accurate and you're You've got a good chance at actually hitting the crit. If you get the crit, yes. 10 damage and shooting is enough to make anyone sweat, really. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so I think, like, in general, probably the last two that you want to activate in this team are the Bombast with the re with the double revolvers, so he can run into the perfect position at the very last moment to get that amazing shot at the beginning of the next turn. Um, and also the Tracker, so that he can catch somebody off guard. Um, and the Tracker actually also... Um, synergizes just the way that he wants to play synergizes with one of their tack ops which is uh, kill someone that has already been activated mm -hmm. um, so that's you know pretty pretty easy pretty straightforward well, I mean I, I, I think it's actually a little bit harder than it looks but it is like it's very doable yep yep so, you know, as far as like the big operatives, the other guys, they're all they're all fine. But we've all seen kind of the pattern of those operatives before. You know, we've got a gunner with a couple with, you know, blast three, which is probably the big one. We've got mm -hmm. the blade kin, which is you know, he can charge from conceal. He's got relentless swords. He fights on death. They're just fine. And then we've got the rifle kin, which is yeah, heavy sniper on a team that's already trapped on four inch movement, which is a little rough. But he has AP one. He has AP one. Yeah, there's something. <laughs> yeah, the big minus on this team is there is not a ton of AP. We've got, mm -hmm. I think, three sources of AP. One, we've got a grenade. Well, no, we don't even have a grenade. I huh? think, yeah, no. I think it's just two. It's, it's the gunner yeah, and the it's sniper. Two pieces of AP. Yeah. So I know I, I do too. wonder. I do wonder how this team will fare against just literally six assault intercessors running at them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the intercessors might find difficult to kill uh, the dwarfs on 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 one swing. Mm. 
So oh, because you have the the damage mitigation, you've got yes. enough just enough to tax where you can parry out and save yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah, that might be true. Uh, and then you've got to pick three warriors, which can take a loadout of you know all the different profiles. Which brings us over to the equipment. I think this team has some interesting stuff in that you can do a lot of different loadouts, right, Ace? Yes. I am, I'm not going to hide. I am a big fan of the, of the knives. Yeah. Knives all the time, all around. Lovely knives. Oh, yes. And because the, the, the cost is only two equipment points, mm-hmm. uh, and the shotgun is three equi- equipment points, I will always take the, um, the warrior with the shotgun, and then place a knife on him and, mm. and call it a day. And then you have two more slots for me. So you, I will spend always three, uh, six equipment points on, on equip my warriors. And then the other one, you can, you can have some play, some tweaks. Yeah, you can like give a shotgun to your Sam Fisher, for example. For example, yeah. Yeah, I actually think it's, it's, it's so crazy. Like the equipment is so much more, like the more you think about it, the more crazy flexible it makes the team where... Mm-hmm. Um, I like that was my first impression, too. It was like, give all the warriors shotguns and then um, give them knives with equipment. But then I was like, you could completely like flip the whole team where you give your warriors knives. And then now all of a sudden you've got enough equipment to because there's like hardly anyone that's good at melee on the team. So if your warriors get Mm. knives just like on their data sheet and then you've got five more knives to give out. Now, all of a sudden you're going to have like, um, you're you're only gonna have one operative that doesn't have a plasma knife, and then that could be like your dude with the with the axe, and then you're fine. Or like the sniper, because the sniper's not gonna be moving quick. He's gonna be in the back, trying to find an angle on one point. <laughs> but yeah, like as I've been working on the team, it's been a struggle because I'm like, oh man, do I want to do shotguns? And it's like the it's the move. They're not really like fast enough to get into a great spot to reliably shotgun people super often, which kind of has me worried. But then it's the same problem with knives. But then at least with the knives, if people charge you, you can fight them off. And with like the the blade master thing, you can pretty much just lurk super aggressively on the front line with a bunch of knives. And if they attack you, you get a reroll. And yeah, so there's there's a. That's kind of one of the like the the latest thing I was thinking about of like oh plot twist um if you if you do give your warriors shotguns it really really cuts back on the number of knives that you can have on the team where if you give them knives and you give knives to everyone else it's like welcome to knife city like it's chopping time mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's interesting cuz the equipment list gives you plasma knives for two equipment points bolt revolvers for one equipment point which i can't imagine you ever actively decide to buy on on on, a, on models a bolt shotgun which is four dice on threes four four or a terrible profile four dice on fives two two with long range and you've got climbing equipment stabilized shells firestorm bolt shells the bolt shells are interesting on in the dark cuz they give you a blast one threat on a shotgun for one equipment point and it seems kind of rude that stabilized shells, which give you a long range profile, lock you into the long range profile and firestorm bolt shells let you freely shoot <laughs> between your different profiles. Yeah, the stabilized then, shell is four dice on fours, three, three, was it? Yeah, four yes. dice on fours, three, three for long range. And then the bolt shells give you just free access to four dice on threes, two, four, blast one on range six. So it seems a little rude. I don't. I don't quite understand the logic behind that, honestly. Yeah, I feel like I both of those shotguns either. are just incredibly feels bad because anyone that like doesn't think about it that that hard, like is not going to realize that it's mathematically like going to just barely not kill. Like there's nothing that it will actually threaten legitimately. And mm. like, yeah, if if you don't like think about it, like if you're just a casual player, you're going to be like, oh, man, these shotguns keep on. I'm so unlucky. I keep on just barely not killing them. And it's like, no, no, no. Mathematically, that's yeah. what it's always going to do. And it's yeah. just like not a great choice. Yeah. Mm. On In the Dark, you know, the blast one gives you access to lethal five on the bolt shells, which is kind of neat. And, you know, against I think veteran guard or some other horde teams, maybe you take one or two guys just to force your opponent to space out. And then you've got your stick bomb variant, which is the two four profile on a blast two grenade. And then you've got uh, rerolls defensively against splash torrent and uh, blast or yeah, actually like no, you just ignore splash entirely, like which is really suit. good, actually. 
the equipment thing you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go up against Necron or a higher tech circle on In the Dark when they switch to all Teslas, mm -hmm. you just give everybody a Ceramite undersuit and <laughs> say it's fine. Yep. Or, blood, or blooded to yeah. avoid the um, demonic grenade. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, you have climbing tools too. Yep. In case you need. Yeah, it's definitely they it feels like they want a lugger too. So like I think looking at them and all of their nice equipment choices, they could have used a lugger or they could have used a medic so that you could start trying to trade a little bit more actively, but it seems like for them their defensive profile to win a shootout is that you can block half damage from a couple of the shots, stay alive and then run away to use your resource for later. Yeah. That, that's why I will play it, to be honest. Just wait, like uh, like the, the Dwarf style. You just wait to your opponent to try to hit you. Then they don't kill you because you are strong. And, and then you run or you hit or you do whatever because they aren't engaged, pretty much. So, yeah, I think that's that's the way to play them. And if your opponent tries to play KG, you send Sam Fisher out there just to yeah. throw a hatchet, knock him out, and then have him run away. <laughs> yeah. That's just going to wall bang you with the hatchet. Yeah. And... and and because you you grow with the pass of the turns or the turning point, sorry, you will have more and more. Well, not more and more, but you will have some three APL here and there. So it will be easier for you to if they try to play KG, you are fine because you will have more flexible APLs. So you can steal some points here and there. Yeah, unlike other teams that have to depend on the comms model to stay within six or to have to do something the previous turn, you have your floating APL as long as you keep everyone alive. So like. Compared to a lot of teams, they don't get stronger, but if you can keep them alive, they will feel stronger over the game compared to a lot of teams that have late game ramp. I think I was comparing them to Handy the Archon and Blooded in my review because Handy the Archon, as you collect pain tokens, your individual operatives get way stronger. Mm -hmm. And for Blooded, as your opponent, as you collect more Blooded tokens, you get stronger. But this team mm -hmm. stays pretty flat. If you can keep your operatives alive, you will just have more opportunities to, you know, move out, move out of cover, shoot someone with a shotgun, and then dash away, or charge fight shoot. And, you know, I think this brings us to the ploys. We've got a pretty spicy one for Bonds That Bond, or Bonds That Bind, where you can chain activate a pair of Jaegers. Ooh. Yes. So you could set up a turn two play where you launch two of your Jaegers with three APL to charge, fight, shoot a mid board opponent. And then, you know, they have defensive, de defensive stuff up, which is, seems pretty good. Have you guys seen any other plays that you're kind of looking forward to do? Mm, so I think they are just solid. Uh, other than the, that's this double activation, you can set up, as we said before, the bombaster, uh, so he can shoot on the on the first thing on the turning point, and then you can activate him and shoot again, and then hide because you have three APL. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways to to play with this three APL to to do stuff pretty much. Yeah, I think we've also got like cool ploys like stalwart defense for when your guys get charged in melee. You know, if you have someone close by within six inches to someone that gets charged, you can have the model that is six inches away, ignore the engagement rule for shooting and just take an overwatch shot and blow someone up. I think this this will work super, uh, super good, super fine on, on Into the Dark because you can be behind a wall. And then it's, it's, it's impossible to shoot you. And if you try to charge me, then I will shoot you in the face. Yeah, and like, there's no restriction to prevent the sniper from doing that. So like, he's going to be hitting you on threes in AP1, three, three, mortal wounds, three. Mm. Like, um, yeah, you got to especially watch out for that because that's going to be pretty gnarly. The, the only thing I think is you cannot do it uh, on conceal because it's an overwatch. So you have to be on engage, which is a little bit sad, yeah. I think. Yeah. That is a, that's yeah. a very good thing to call out. A cool team. A very solid, very dwarfy feeling team. You know, yes. compared to, I think, Salvagers. Salvagers, I think, on release, didn't feel overly dwarfy to me. Mm -hmm. Like, they could take a punch and they held grudges, which was fine. But they were so complicated on, like, yeah. I have 16 different things that I have to do at different times. Just to, like, have rerolls everywhere. I was like, there's a lot to manage. This, this team seems a lot tighter and a lot more, like, focused on like the flavor of it all like ha getting charged and telling your friend behind you like ah i'm gonna take this shoot shoot this guy take a couple wounds so i can knife him seems great yes. being on the ga2 because you're you've got your friend there and then uh mm -hmm. no kin left behind is really flavorful when one of your operatives dies you can turn him into a a token aura that gives 
free retain or uh, upgrade a normal into a crit, which has been really good historically. It's it's better than a free retrain. It, it upgrades a fail to a normal or a normal to a crit, which is super yeah. solid. Um, actually, just as we've been chatting, I thought of another argument for the knife warriors uh, and just like spamming the knives, which which we, we know Ace loves the dwarf knives. Um, since you only have four inches of movement, you want to you want to be charging to take advantage of all of your movements. So if everyone has knives and everyone wants to charge, you're going to steal back those two inches of movement all over the place. And then if you're like just tanky enough that people don't really want to fight you or like if you fight them, it's you're actually a pretty strong contender. That's that's probably actually like a pretty decent key to their mobility is just like creeping up on people with knives. So the thing about this Jagger is that um, their brothers didn't have any reroll on combat, but then with the... Master Blade, I don't know the, the name in English. Master Blade uh, work. Yes. Or they Master can do Blade work. They can do a lot. With, with four attacks on force, with the knife, you don't usually charge because you are up to a really bad time if you face two dice, which is really possible. Uh, but with this, there is the, the, the odds are way better if you want to just charge into someone and then shoot to have to, have to kill two models in one, in one swing. You can do this a lot easier with this team, I think. Mm. yeah because that double activation and if everyone's got knives and like you've got a couple of operatives that have like the decent shooting like someone that already has a shotgun i'd have to take a look again or like um give a give a knife to your bombast and have him charge Mm -hmm. kill someone with a knife and then kill someone with his dual nine inch pistols um and then you did the group activation and then someone else does that and all of a sudden you have this crazy double activation spearhead that just like pushes deep and just like really drive the drive into the heart of the enemy Mm -hmm. yep yep and you know the enemy in the box is the brood brothers you know the foul cult has found a hold in beta decima (laughs) and i think (laughs) has taken the lion's share of the conversation on the internet i think at this point i'm sure yep yeah, uh, out, unless you're a 40k player, in which case the only thing that the <laughs> players have been talking about is we've got infiltrate, we've got infiltrate, and <laughs> I that's the other thing that I'm kind of worried about with this box is how many kill team players will actually get a hold of the box in comparison to 40k players buying it <laughs> for the hard kid for the Hearn kid. Yeah, and then hopefully those 40k players will uh, give their tokens and books and stuff to the kill team crew. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. The Brew Brother Kill Team, you know, they're the Gene Stiller Colts, Electric Boogaloo, you know, we've got the Wormblade, which were like, I guess the more elite, but I don't know. I don't, the Wormblade didn't have access to a Gene Stealer Patriarch, <laughs> which is like a Custodes tier level threat in the Warhammer 40k lore, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. It's like a you Custodes get... level threat in Kill Team too. That's true. That's true. Yes. But like, you know, just the fact that we have another one of these like, oh, yes, the thing has been alive for 800 <laughs> years plotting in the background. <laughs> and did we confirm that it's on a 50 millimeter? Yes. Yes. He's, huge. He's a huge, chonky boy. He's the and thickest he, man. He cannot go into Octarius or under Octarius. I don't, I don't think he can, really. It's a tall he model. He doesn't fit. So you yeah. cannot go through it. Yeah, just anything. like the icon bear on the Colts before yes. him, he is too tall to fit under some buildings. He's just going to have to stand there at the edges and just just get there normally. Yes. Oof. And yeah, there's uh, probably going to be like plenty of places where he's just like too thick to fit. But then like once he does get there, his threat range is enormous. Mm-hmm. I guess since, you know, we're on the Patriarch, I think that's what the fans are here for. You know, what are our thoughts? You know, Ace, do you how do you feel about the Patriarch making it in the kill team? I th- I think he's a, thre- a threat. He's going to be used. I think he's going to trap some players because mm-hmm. I-, I think we are all mesmerized uh, about the Patriarch. But I think there is a lot of play on the on the other two leaders. Mm-hmm. And one of the main things about the about the player is going to be on what team what team sorry what team are you facing and what uh, what what of your leaders do you want to bring into the into the kill zone it's going to be super interesting to see the different strategies the different leaders brings to the table yeah for anyone who hasn't read the rules yet you're the brood brothers are kind of a generic ish human team with 10 operatives access to a reroll rule called crossfire which adds tokens to opponents as you fail to kill them in shooting or melee 
And then you can spend those tokens to get rerolls, which is kind of a basic reroll mechanic that I think most people could have kind of guessed at. But the big twist is we have access to the Brood Coven. We get access to three selections. If you take a Patriarch, it eats up all three of your selections. Otherwise, yeah. you can take a Magus, which is a more support style ranged operative. And, or you could take a Primus, which is a more aggressive turn control centric operative. And then your last choice is probably going to be a pair of Psychic Familiars, which seem very good by my eyes. Because you get a GA2 pair that can dodge through engagement range, can do mission actions, and has Super Conceal. With an actual melee profile that is not the worst if you need to finish off someone that's actually injured. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, honestly, uh, yeah, it's they did a good job of... of internally balancing those because if, if it was just like oh the patriarch is the best don't even bother with the others that'd be kind of a disappointment um but then again it, it, i'm a little disappointed because i'm like the patriarch is the coolest and i want to like if i was playing him i'd be like let me play only the patriarch just because he's the vibes are right you know he's he's got big doom guy energy minus the equipment thing it's true the uh, the patriarch for for what it's worth you know for anyone who doesn't know he's got Six inches of movement, four APL, which he can use over two separate activations on a given turning point. He's got four a four up invuln and twenty one wounds, and he cannot hide behind light cover because he is, as we said, a humongous chunky boy that cannot fit under Octarius buildings. <laughs> he can't move more than nine inches in a turn, so you cannot have him normal move, end a move, and then normal move again. That's not allowed. Or you could, as long as you. Don't move, yeah, don't than move more than nine inches total across the, yes. the entire turn. So you could do a charge that's short, finish someone off, and then normal move somewhere else afterwards on a second activation. So he does break the activation game that most people are like, most people play a game throughout on a model because he can activate mm -hmm. on two separate things. And I think he can actually charge and fight twice because there's no, it's two separate activations yes. in one turning point. So he can, that's, he can, he can charge, fight, wait, charge, fight. If he wants. Yeah. yeah. He, his melee profile, five attacks on twos, five, six, relentless rending. So he will basically reliably kill anything he touches. I think relentless with rending on twos means that you're basically never going to miss anything on five attacks. And yeah, at least one, something is going to be a crit somewhere. <laughs> yes. There we go. <laughs> He's going to kill pretty much any marine yeah. or whatever. Uh, one anything, of the important but... things to mention is he can mind control people also. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So mind control is you pick someone within two inches of the patriarch and you roll a die and compare your D6 plus your APL versus your opponent's APL. And if you roll over them, they're mind controlled for the next activation because you immediately GA to that person effectively. And then yep. when you do that, they can change their order and perform one action. But you can't take a normal move, so you can only do a dash. I think, in my estimation, it looks like maybe against something like Gellerpox, this would be really annoying because they have to group up on you and you can mind control a, a Hulk and have it smash a mutant, <laughs> which could be really gross. Especially if it's that one dude that can fight everyone around him. The bloat spawn or whatever his name is. Yeah. Against teams like maybe like Felgor, if you take control of uh, Mr. Bonkstick... You mind control mm -hmm. him. He bonk sticks everyone around him. Your opponent's like, oh, no, I don't want this. <laughs> Whether or not that ability is actually good, just because there is a risk that it doesn't do anything, it costs two APL to do the mind control action, and you've got to be uh, not in engagement range, but pretty pretty darn close to it. You know, that remains to be seen. But if you ever get to a, a spot where you run over to your opponent's explosive dude, like on Blooded, if you manage to mind control the diabolic and he chucks the grenade and hits a pile of your own dudes that is going to be like absolutely devastating i think in actual gameplay terms yeah because you can really catch people out um you know they're they're like oh your blast threat is over here and then you're like but your blast threat is right in the heart of it all and then you take control of it mm -hmm. yeah and you can only do it once per battle i don't know if that means that you can only attempt to do this once per battle or if you have mm. to succeed and get the mind control off I, I read this yesterday, and mm. at least in Spanish, it said when you success to the to the action. Yeah. So if, if you don't, then you're fine. Yeah. The so way I read it again. initially is that you need to do the mind control all the way through for you to have yes. counted as used it. Because otherwise, yes. I feel like it's probably too much of a risk to really do. 
Yep, yep, so yep. the patriarch, obviously, very cool, very flavorful, very splashy. But you are giving up, I think, a fair amount of power when you do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you've got access to either a pair of familiars or some other kind of like silly tactical assets that might be good. But the familiars are definitely good. You know, a pair of GA2 yeah. guys that have super conceal. We know that super conceal is really powerful and they can get to objectives through engagement range, which means there's going to be some situations where a pair of familiars like sprints out from behind a wall and gets two points that your opponent isn't expecting. Ooh, and uh, hmm, go ahead. Can I, sorry, they can play. I was checking if they can play recon. Mm-hmm. They cannot. They cannot. They, they cannot. Are you sure? Uh, it is in. They that is the one they don't have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know. In in Spanish they say it said recon. So. Oh yeah. no. <laughs> we found another one of these. So yay! I have infiltration, recon, and seek and destroy. And it's okay, infiltration, so in, seek and destroy. On the English security. rule book, it says infiltration, security, <laughs> seek and destroy. That's fine. I, I was thinking about the familiars uh, planting the. Um, I think transponders. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah yeah. 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 That would be really gross. Yes. Oh man! Thank God they can't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they can um, in Spain, I guess. Yeah. They, no, we, we will play as the as the English book said. Yeah. Always. So the pair of familiars is obviously very powerful. It counts as one selection. The other two operatives that count as two selections for your three. The first one is the Magus. He is a defensive, probably anti shooting option i think you know he gives a five up flat invuln to the entire team you cannot be injured and your apl cannot be modified which on its face sounds really good just from having played a lot of these shooting matchups because this team does have access to a generic medic so you can just get into a shootout and your medic will never give any downsides which from my time on star striders has felt very good (laughs) yes and you know that's backed up with him being a force uh a three APL, nine wound, four up save model with you know, pretty basic stats. And then he can subtract APL from someone visible to him, which historically has also been really good. You know, that shows up in Chaos Cults, yeah, Pathfinders. Just, just visible and like, does he, but he has to spend an action to do it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that yeah. is still incredibly strong. Uh, does he roll for yeah. it or anything? He just does it. He just does it. Yeah, that's uh, yep. That's super good. And he can do it on conceal. So he's just standing around, just yeeting people's APL, which is is rough. And that's and actually gonna... gonna smack the heck out of uh, like Nemesis Claw, for example. I mean, there's a lot of people yeah. that are really gonna like get wrecked by that. So don't sleep on that. To be honest, in in any kill zone that the objectives are on on seven, on seven inches from the from the drop zone. So you need a uh, move dash and pick up. Most of the time, you need an extra APL to just reach there. Uh, the Magus, the, he can just say, nope, you are not going to reach. You are not going to loot. Uh, on, this, on, on this matchup, you are not going to loot. Uh, on this turning point, it's going to be a 4-2 a because you are not going to loot, my man. Or even just like a 3-2, you know, like just stopping yes. your opponent from getting their even split puts a lot of pressure on the later turns. And the Magus yeah. can just like look at someone and be like, all right. Get, get screwed, kid. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and we haven't even gotten to the best juice, which is the mental onslaught, which is his 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 gun, basically. It's, it's crazy, yeah. And you can do it on silent, because it, all it says is select yep. what, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. It's a, yep. It's it's a, a, it's a silent, yeah. silent mental blast, which is a one AP action that... Someone within someone suffers two mortal wounds, and then you start rolling against their APL until you hit a cap of eight wounds, doing damage in chunks of two. So you just pick someone that is in full line of sight, so it is effectively a silent shooting attack. Mm-hmm. They yep. take two damage up front, or four if you're within six inches of them, and then you roll against their APL. If you roll higher, or equal to or less, equal to or less, so you roll their APL or lower, then they take an extra two, and you keep doing it until they hit eight wounds so it's not quite a guaranteed eight wounds but it is a guaranteed two wounds and i suspect you'll generally be expecting four to six wounds out of this and against most targets i agree yep yep she's really or she or he is really powerful yep Mm -hmm. uh especially because it's backed up by a couple other uh combo abilities across the rest of the team so the magus is one of the choices he seems pretty good but then the primus the flip side the more aggressive Aggress- the shooting shooting melee operative also has mm-hmm. his own his own powers. Yes. Yep. Yep. 
Is the Magus Basically, the one that messes up people's turns? No, that's the Primus. So the Magus is the one that messes up their activations and gives you uh, better defensive stats. Oh, yeah, the Primus the out here, though, about. he's out there just stabbing the shit out of people. <laughs> Pretty much, yep. So the thing for me with the Primus is that he you want you still want him him or the or the Magus you want them on the backline. Mm -hmm. Both of them have silenced weapons. Um, um, pick this with a grain of salt, but they are silent. And and he can shoot. He can shoot twice, and he can give you uh, CPs, which is amazing on the Primus. And he can manipulate the initiative. So I don't know the the maths on this, but I think if you give the initiative on turning point one, and then with the Primus you are allowed to re to reroll, I think you are something on. 60, maybe 70% of the time you are going to have the turning point two initiative, which so is can, huge. You can re-roll and add one to your initiative, and you can do that no. every turn with this guy. One, one, of, each. one of those. One of each. Yeah, you get one yeah. of each. But, but if you didn't have the initiative in the previous turn, you can re-roll. Yes. You can always add one to the roll, which means that he's always pretty solid at giving you a six, about a 16% chance at least of getting the next turn's initiative, because that plus one is effectively just a full extra yes. dice face, which is about 16%. So the Mastermind ability on the Primus lets you fudge initiative. And Conspire is very similar to the Phobos uh, CP generation. So, you know, if you're outside of three, you get an extra CP for an APL. He's a three APL operative, just like the Magus. So while he doesn't provide a team-wide buff, he does give you initiative more often, which can kind of be like a buff. Yes. And then yeah. once your opponents hit your, your dork lines at the midboard... The Primus is really good in melee. He's not Patriarch good, but five dice on twos, four, five, lethal five rending. Nothing to really scoff at. Mm -hmm. And in the yeah. meantime, he's got two different needle pistol profiles. One of them, both of them are silent, but the long range one is four dice on threes, two, four, lethal five silent, which is pretty darn respectable, especially when you can double shoot. Yes, yes. Yeah, and then they also have tactical assets. Uh, yeah, are they think... ever worth taking? Mace. Sorry? Or do you think the tactical assets that the no. Brood Brothers have access to are ever really going to be worthwhile? Nah, I, th I think you are going to stick with the Familiar, Magus, Patriarch, and Primus, to be honest. Other than that, I don't think that the is worth considering, to be honest. They are, not that, they are not that good. Yeah, it's kind of disappointing. I think Lookout has some interesting applications. Lookout, of the three tactical assets, there's... Interference, which messes with your opponent's APL, but has some pretty heavy restrictions and some dice rolling, so it's not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Reinforcement, which is an extra brood brother only within six inches of your drop zone, which is kind of whatever. Like, it's just a dude who just shows up in the back line to cover a point, which doesn't mm -hmm. seem great. Kind of like hiding from the worm blade before them. And then Lookout, I think, is probably the most compelling one out of those three tactical assets. Basically, it's a floating activation similar to other tactical assets across other teams. And Lookout basically gives someone and a blast profile, so someone and everyone within two inches of that person, a crossfire token. Whether or not that's better than a pair of GA2 <laughs> super concealed familiars that can run around and do mission objectives, seems like a hard sell to me, but of those three, that is the one that at least reads like something that might be usable. Yeah, I agree. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um... I think one of the other big callouts here for those brood brood coven operatives, the cool parts of the team, is that the Pr Magus and the Primus have can take equipment. So the Primus can be your spooky dooky grenade carrier if you really wanted him to, if you didn't take the sapper for some reason. But really, it just also means that they can take the covert guys, which gives you a free dash at the beginning of the game. So they can always mm -hmm. be in the correct position. Mm hmm. Um, the Magus specifically, because he has the five of invuln, can take the cult talisman, which means that in cover he's going to be very hard to stuff, even with a uh, plasma gun pointed at him. So, yeah, the guard, the coven definitely has some cool things. The brood guard in general, or brood brothers in general, have probably some of the cooler ploys. What do you think, Ace? I think, yeah, I think they have like super amazing ploys. And if you pick the Primus, as we said, you're going to have to, you're going to be able to do extra more. Mm -hmm. So for me, the, the best or the best one, they, they have a, some combinations on, on the ploys with the equipment that we can talk about later. 
but for me the the best one is the is the last one uh, the one which they can uh, make a free dash uh, out of activation so it's like uh, they have to start the activation the activation they have to start the dash on without uh, outside sorry of the line of sight of the enemy and they have to end the the um, that uh, dash outside of the, outside of line of sight but this free dash allows them to make a lot of uh, things on the um, on the battlefield like it opens a lot of place i think mm -hmm. yeah it gives you an extra out of act act out of activation positional play yes. and i think because this team is kind of a human coded team there is a lot of teamwork stuff built into the team We've got the Icon Ward, which is their Icon Bearer. He can give a six-inch bubble of on-death fight, on-death shoot, or do mission mm -hmm. action, which seems really good. Got the Agitator, which gives free crossfire tokens to people within six. The mm -hmm. Medic, obviously still important. And I think my favorite, like, cute little combo that I've seen while looking at the rulebook, based, on, based around Insidious allowing you to do an out-of-step activation, is you can send the Brood Guard in to go cover for Magus or Primus. It's a little overexposed. And if the <laughs> medic is also covering the brood guard, brood guard can do unquestioning loyalty, which is a get down Mr. President variant, but he can do it for free. So if he's next to a medic and your opponent goes to a plasma gun to go try to kill your primus or your patriarch or your good luck <laughs> or your magus, you could just have the brood guard jump in front with unquestioning loyalty, block the die. And then suddenly the medic is there to just res him. So because you have Insidious and you can kind of like lay out all of these things out of step, your opponent might not be ready for when it happens because it might not be there before he goes to set up. So yeah. the thing is, they, they can do even on combat, if I am not mistaken. So they can do it to shooting and to, and to combat, can they? Uh, you cannot fight on death with the brute. No, 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 I, no, no, no. For unquestioning uh, loyalty? Get, yes, get down Mr. Oh. President works also on combat if they charge you, oh, I think. So, yeah, uh, good luck oh, so trying to kill the... That's that, that hasn't been there before, right? Yes, or did, I think did, that's new. Did Wormblade get that before? Wormblade. Wormblade has that one, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah. So you can force even shooting, even melee attacks onto the right thing. I guess oh, it's kind yeah. of the dogs have it in um, on Star Striders and Crude. So it's not like it hasn't appeared elsewhere, but it's not super duper common. And I don't think people think about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah but the, uh, you can't have them, like, charge in like the dogs can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, yeah, ruthless so there's coordination I wanted to shout out as well, which is super interesting. It's like ignore obscuring, but even stronger. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, or just normally as strong because it's um, when someone is making a shooting attack, you can determine line of sight using a another like an ally. Yeah. Yep. I think there's definitely big. some big, big play here against teams that you out activate. You know, you send your familiars in and suddenly your opponent is not in heavy cover or not in cover at all. <laughs> Which seems really yeah. powerful, and you you can combine with the dash that we told that that we told before because you can get like a, an enormous uh, threat range with that, and it's I think it's it, ha it has some similarities with the um, with the Necrons uh, the Heretech Circle mm. uh, leader ability, if I'm not mistaken. It's I the, think that, it's like shooting through your friend basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. But so the, there are the, some the Heretech can do it on melee, and I don't think they can. These guys yes, can. you cannot be in engagement range to do it. So this yeah. one is like you have a spotter. The spotter gives you the full position and suddenly mm -hmm. you're getting shot at from like a corner that doesn't make sense. So yes. for teams <laughs> that get out activated or for a flank that you fully finished, you can suddenly put yourself in a lot of danger against the brood, the brood brothers, mm -hmm. because a familiar going up behind your enemy lines that's just, you know, hanging out. If he's not going to get shot now, all of the operatives on that corner can shoot your opponent with no cover effectively or like no no nothing like you don't even get no you get no yep. benefits from any of your terrain that can be Crazy. extremely scary yes and they don't have a, a grenade launcher they they have a grenade launcher they do have a uh, they have a, they have, a, they have everything you know they they're just like a human oh, like a normal God. human team with three gunners <laughs> their sniper is it's fine i mean four dice on twos three three heavy silent mortal wounds three is pretty average he doesn't have any defensive things but you know we've come to love and respect the stupid veteran guard sniper rifle yeah. profile so here we well, are they can feel only three gunners though were two gunners on the sniper or three yeah. gunners in total yeah. yeah three gunners in total i think you know the power of the brood coven probably make up for the loss of a single gunner i agree yep, yep. 
Yeah. Well, you, then, you lost you lost two gunners in two Bedgar. Oh, true. Because true. Yeah, because normally you can take four gunners and you can yes. take a sniper rifle. So yeah. yeah, it's definitely a more mixed focus team. Yeah, yeah. But I think in response, you've gotten a lot of mini upgrades across everyone. You know, it's very funny looking at the veteran guard bruiser compared to the brood brothers, ve- <laughs> brood brother yeah. agitator, which is the same kind of like melee dork profile, you know, seven mm-hmm. wounds, five up save, uh, but four dice on fours, four, four stun is a respectable melee profile, which is nice. Yes. You can also equip him with a las gun if you really wanted him to shoot for some reason. He's got Devoted, which means that in combat he ignores the first normal damage, just like a Bruiser. But he also gives a 6-inch bubble of free crossfire tokens, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. And the thing with that um, Siren is that he's going to benefit from it. So every time you fight with them, you're going to have maybe one and probably two rerolls, Which is yeah. amazing. Have, have you guys looked at their attack ops and feel like they're pretty good? I think they are fine. They are fine. They yeah, are. I, they're fine. I thought they were fine when I looked at them. Yes. I think meticulous preparation uh, seems a little annoying to do because it's a bunch of extra APL. But with two familiars running around in the background, you can probably get away with it. Mm-hmm. So if you're playing capture or something where you don't need to do extra extra APL mission things, then meticulous preparation gives your familiar something to do. You have to spend an APL on something that's not prepared. Uh, you don't have to control it. Oh, no, you do have to control it. So you could basically you spend an APL on something you control and it becomes prepared for ascension. And then you have to mm-hmm. do it on over half of the objective markers. And then you need to friendly operatives need to control over half of those objective markers, but they don't have to be prepared. So you need to win. You need to do a thing and then win harder, which is not generally a great tack up spread. Mm-hmm. Just because needing to do the second half requires you to be ahead twice. So it is doable because you've got the guys to do it, but whether or not that's what you want to be doing with your time, I don't know. Maybe on Into the Dark, where the objectives are closer, and on yeah. on, on Capture. Maybe. Yeah, so you score this at the end of the game? At the end yes. of the battle, yeah. Okay. But yeah. you have to do the things during the game. And then clandestine elimination is if a friendly operative is incapacitated by a friendly brood brother within six inches of it, and friendly operatives are not in line of sight to other enemy operas when this happens. Score one VP seems like probably one too many things to have to yes. juggle. Because <laughs> like you have to do something, you have a range restriction, and then you can't be seen. It's like it's it's so flavorful, but generally I think it's easier for people to know that that's coming and then just kind of like set up visibility lines. I th- yeah, I mean honestly, it's like if you crush one flank and then you. Uh, you kill someone point blank when the flank is crushed, then you've got that one, and then on the other side, do it again. But that's also like that's a lot, yeah. maybe and against, then, against elite teams. Yeah, it's yeah, there's a, there's a couple spots where maybe it's usable, but whether or not it's better than just the default tack ops is probably the harder sell for me because some mm-hmm. of these are actually harder than just whatever's in the archetypes right now, which is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which means that I'd probably be less likely to take them. And then militant leadership, you know, if you're ever taking the patriarch or probably going to take this well even the the primals can score this yes so it's basically like leader leader uh, wound count tally which shows up in a couple places and considering that our leader operatives are going to be brood coven operatives that can do a bunch of extra wounds even the magus actually with the psychic onslaught can score this because this is it's not a melee centric thing it's whenever your dude does a thing that causes your opponent to lose wounds you start the tally and if you can keep your leader alive and you hit 12 wounds you're good that's two points yeah so it's deal 12 wounds for one point and then stay alive for another so it's like uh yeah uh, that's probably my favorite yeah, but the, I think even that one is not really guaranteed to go off because sometimes your leaders don't do 12 wounds. I mean, generally, they, I think with this team, you can expect the Patriarch to for sure do it. The Primus probably can do it. And the Magus probably can do it. Yeah, I think the, the hardest part is the second one. So yeah. your leader has to survive. Yep. Other than that, I think three or all three leaders can, can do 12 wounds. Yeah, because the, like the Patriarch can slay super hard, but if he's like coming in aggressive like that, you're going to trade him. Yep, yep, that's the thing. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things here for getting that to trigger is actually that the Medic can save everything except for the Patriarch. 
So you can just have medics camping around your Primus and your your Magus so they can, you know, go do their job and then not die. So pretty, pretty powerful. So I think of the three, that would be the one that I would expect gets played. But even with that, like, there's so many other things you could be doing. So the, the only thing for me is you have to drop one of the operatives. Which one is going to be the one? It's going mm. to be difficult. I think, you know, my first blush looking at the team, the knife fighter seems a kind of like an easy skip for me compared to mm -hmm. the other operatives who all have their unique things. And I prefer medic play compared to what it sounds like a lot of my local players do because the medics are really good at breaking shooting. But if you're doing a melee matchup, the medic is going to just be less good because medics can only save shooting attacks. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ace? What do you think you'd be dropping? So the thing about the knife fighter is that I have found a little bit, um, well, some strategy for the for for him. Mm -hmm. He can actually uh, uh, threat threat a lot on turning point one because with the disguise and he can move three, and then because he can charge on conceal, he can still charge on conceal and kill into someone because uh, right now his four attacks on three, three four, little five plus relentless. But anytime the opponent resolves a dice against you, it doesn't matter if it's a hit or a parry, he gets one more Tagoon. So that's the th that's that's going to that 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 means that he's going to die. If you hit yeah. them with eight goons, if you hit them with three, four, he's going to die. And that's yeah, amazing. He's, he's yes. not great against the ten wounders, I think. Just because I, you know they can they can tank it out, but against yeah, anything that anything that is eight down, down, down uh, Nuz fighter like, looks like he is a really able to respectable turn one threat. But if your opponent is paying attention between, between Insidia and the Patch Game Dash, you are now six inches at the board, which is generally more than enough to hit any mid board objective, even with defensive play. Yep. yep. So you're right. The knife fighter does have some nice lines to really. So force your opponent into awkward positions. <laughs> I completely agree. So for me, the, the, the two that I have more, uh, as you said before, uh, the Medic is going to sit when you are playing against melee teams. Mm -hmm. And on other occasion, I think I, I will sit the, the Icon Bearer. I think the Icon Bearer is amazing, but it's difficult, you know, it's difficult to sit somebody in, in this team because they are all great. But for me, it's the, it's the other one because his ability kind of overlaps a little with the Medic. So that's why. But it's going to be difficult. It's going to be, you know, something that uh, all players have to have to think about. And, and, yeah, and, and I, I think, and... you know, just as a reminder or just as an explanation, the Icon Ward is this team's Icon Bear. We touched on it a little bit earlier on, but just to so everybody knows what it does. It has the standard plus one APL for controlling objectives that all Icon Bears do. He's got an OK melee profile, four dice on fours, three, five. So he's not he's respectable in combat. Mm -hmm. But he's got Broodmind Devotion, which is a six-inch bubble, very similar to the Novitiate's Reliquarius, which gives you a free action or f on death. Mm -hmm. It can't be used at the same time as the Medic, so you only get to do one on death thing per bubble. But it does mean that if you had both of them and a Magus in a, in a shooting matchup, you would send both the Medic and the Icon Ward to like wholly separate areas of the map, and now your opponent is just playing fully asymmetric shooting fightouts, which is sounds miserable. So you know what's amazing? Uh, you know, you remember that the Magus allows you to because shooting on fives is not great, correct? But if you are not injured, <laughs> even if you die, you can yep. shoot on fours. That's true. The Magus has a co big combo with the Icon Ward, which yep. says no one is injured, so you can just have everybody on engage, start a shootout, get shot at, put a crossfire token on your opponent, get killed. Icon Ward says do it one more time, and then you pop out with a crossfire token now. And yep. now, you know, you're reliably killing most things in a shootout really, really hardcore because you're doing fully two double shooting actions over your opponents. And as we've seen with Space Marines, two shooting actions will generally do the job. Yep. yep. And like, I feel like it would be pretty easy to get your demolition guy to throw a demo pack on death. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, I didn't even... I didn't even think about that and one. And like he could, because he's got blast on that too, right? He could run up, blow himself up, and then shoot again, maybe? Uh, no, because that's in the same activation. I mean, you're right. There is definitely something to be said for a Broodmind Devotion Icon Ward with a sapper running in to go chuck the bomb, or just putting the sapper in a position where your opponent can only shoot at it and you're like within range of other stuff. 
Uh, if your opponent kills it, then he suddenly chucks the bomb, oh, and that's yep. unacceptable because it's normally a two APL action. But if you get a free shoot action, the free free shoot action is free. And if he's going to have to be free. on an engage order to do that, though. Oh yeah, he's just asking for it at that point. But if you walk up, chuck a crack grenade, doink a person, and then your opponent's like, "Okay, I'm going to shoot this guy," you're like, "All right, cool, on death, throw the bomb." <laughs> yes. And the thing with the Sapper is he can, if I'm not mistaken, again. Um, even without the icon ward, he can perform the explosive uh, action if he dies, isn't it? Uh, he can't do it within engagement range, so I think that's the big, the big stuck part. So but, even with the icon ward, uh, yeah, final, but if, 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 if someone gets, if someone gets into you to try to on into a dart, for example, if someone tries to uh, get into you and shoot into your face within two you are always able to perform the explosive because mm. he's going to be so close to you. Correct. So he's going to die, too. Yes. So, yeah, the sapper, you know, the grenade holder of, you know, the pattern of many teams, he's got an unwieldy bomb, which is four dice on threes, five, six, AP one, indirect, blast two, all the other stuff. So it's a very scary bomb, but it's unwieldy, which is a minus. But he also has the special ability explosives, which you have to do twice. One, to do the setup and then one to press the button to blow it up. And he mm -hmm. can do the explosives action on death. So, and these kind of position in a way where if he eats a comms buff, he can move up, throw a normal grenade, then drop an explosives package somewhere. And then if he gets killed, he just presses the button on death and blows it up. And the explosives do 2d6 mortal wounds to everyone within two inches, <laughs> which, is, which is a lot. <laughs> And he comes with a free frag, free frag, obviously, because why? Obviously. You know that's just how grenadiers work. Yes. You know, at least they don't have a fusion grenade. That's fine, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, just a crack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if it wasn't enough, the comms operative, comms variant for this team, also has an extra bonus ability called mm -hmm. Jam, which is someone within line of sight or visible if you spend, choose to spend two APL. So there's a conditional APL, AP spend for this ability, and you just stun them for D6 activations, and they just got to wait. You just jam their comms, and someone visible to this guy for two APL or one AP for a line of sight, Yay. you know, they just wait around for a little bit. So did he need this? <laughs> Time will tell. Yeah. Just had to add to that big brain effect of the team. Yeah. Oof. So, you know, at the end of the day, this team is hitting on fours base, five wound or five up save, seven wounds. So traditionally, these teams go down like paper. When you have a Magus in the background covering you with no injury and five up, five up invulns, they probably will do a little bit better than they look in a shootout. So, is that is that going to be enough? The team is not crazy, crazy melee focused, but in the matchups where you need to be crazy melee focused, you do have the big boy Patriarch and the Primus ready in the background to do the counter punch. So they're, it feels like they're, they have more than enough tools to at least have a 50 50 against most teams. If not a little bit better, depending on if you can, if, if not a little bit better, depending on how well you select your operative types for your matchup, you know? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. To be honest, it's difficult to, to qualify the, the, the power of these teams. I think the the Brew Brothers have a lot. Uh, they they bring a lot to the table. They have they are, they are so flexible. They have so many different ways to approach the um, the kill zone. They can adapt a lot. They can play three archetypes. I don't know. They have everything at least on paper. But who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I think one of the things that I'm disappointed about design wise over this over beta decima is that many of the teams have access to too many archetypes compared yes. to earlier designs. So teams just have the flexibility to do whatever they want, which is fun for the player, but I think makes balancing the teams a little bit harder. I agree. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, if maybe... Because right right now, for for example, Recon, I think a lot of people think is one of the better archetypes. So anyone with Recon gets a buff, but maybe too many people have Recon. <laughs> yes. Uh, I am excited to play this box. I thank you for GW for giving me and Jason an early copy and, you know, Ace for helping to do the Goonhammer coverage for it, you know, which is why Ace is on here. <laughs> and, and yeah, I think I'm very excited for both of these teams. You know, Hernkin look cool, maybe not as obviously powerful as the Brood Brothers, which I think look obviously 
very powerful. I don't know where they're going to sit on tier lists. I don't know if you guys have rough, rough estimations and where you think they're going to lay. Uh, it's difficult to know, but I think... Well, I, I can say. I, I think that the um, Brute Brothers are going to be an S tier team. Ooh. But my but my S tier is way more... Um, uh, the, the difference between the S tier and the A tier in my tier list at least are uh, less or are little than other tier lists. So I don't think it's a broken team, but I think they have a lot of tools. So it's difficult to know just on paper. Um, but I think they are super powerful. Uh, other than that, the Jaggers, I think they are going to be something on low A team, high B team, just because they move a little, I think. And I think Hearn can, if they don't do well, they have lots of levers for easy buffs, like resourceful being used on turn one, or even just one bonus APL on turn one, I think would go a long way to making sure that they're definitely, definitely playable. Uh, mostly because I think their ploys and all of their abilities in mini games are fun. Like the tracker has this whole separate vibe that I think actually should be good enough for him to be a big player on the team mm -hmm. in doing mm -hmm. things in ways that opponents are not used to in the game. Because most people are trying to cut activations, but Jaegers are out here trying to bait your opponent so that you can blow them up after they've done their thing. They, after they've exhausted themselves, the dwarves are here ready to pick up the slack. Yeah, and I think they can even tweak the forward deploy. So you are always on conceal. You cannot change the order, but you can charge on conceal, or if you can, or you can shoot on your own conceal if you can. Yeah. That would be really good and really easy to tweak, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if like, I think they they look like a nice change of pace too from the other dwarf teams, and they play very differently. So I'm I'm excited mm -hmm. to see where they end up. And I I kind of I think both me and Jason when we were reading the rules initially. We were we thought both of the teams were cool. It's just Brood Brothers tickle my brain a little bit harder <laughs> so i picked yeah. them up uh, to be honest i like the way that uh games workshop is taken with these teams i think they have more uh complicated or more funnier ways to play even, even though they have at least from jaggish they have a lot of warriors a bunch of warriors here and there i think the rules are really cool and they have a lot of flavor so i like them more than other teams or other previous teams yeah, so. compared to something like the Mandrakes dorks, where the Mandrakes are literally like three three guys that all look exactly the same and function exactly the same. <laughs> Jaeger have actual choices on their warriors, which I think is nice. I agree. Yep. How about you, Jason? Where where are you feeling on the box at the end of this podcast? You know, uh, especially throughout our conversation today, I'm I'm even more excited than I was an hour and a half ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we stumbled into a lot of uh, good insights that I am like, oh man, I'm ready to go get some games in with these. Yeah. Uh, so for anyone listening, thanks for hanging out. Ace, thanks for coming. Hopefully uh, Spain is excited for these new teams. We are super excited and we are ready to play uh, a lot with them and to see uh, how powerful they really are. And thank you for having me. Yeah. You're going to be competing at the World Team Championship later this year? Yes. Yeah. Any other big Spanish tournaments you want to do a final call out for any of our random Spanish listeners? on? Mm. We have a big tournament on July, on 5th of July, on, on Cantabria, which is uh, north of Spain, uh, really good weather, even on summer, so if you can uh, bring your team. And on September, we are going to have uh, in Madrid uh, some kind of replication of the WTC. So if you want to come to Madrid, uh, have a team of five players, enjoy the Spanish September, which is pretty nice, and enjoy the Spanish community. Uh, we are open to every player, so just uh, give me a DM and I will uh, I will arrange it with you. Yep. Nice. All right. Well, if anyone wants to take a team t team trip to Spain in September, sounds like a good time. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for coming for our termination tarnation review, and uh, we'll catch you soon. If we missed anything, please message us on the Discord. See you there. See you.